Yeah. Just look what I found. Um, okay. First thing, yeah. where, tell me about where, yeah. where you were born. You turn that off. You want to my uh, mic? I think it's warm enough in here. Whoa! <laughs> she just kind of fell back. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't know how far is this curve out here uh, going out of Milburn. Just a little bit to the left, out where those, where the guy that used to have the, uh, the singing. Uh huh. I was born right near there. The bluegrass thing out there? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is there a little trailer park type thing out there? Uh, yeah. Okay. The old house is gone, but that's where I was born. How long did you live there? Well, I just lived there probably, uh, probably a couple of years, but then my dad moved just a little ways from there, back this way, and lived there till I was about five years old. And do, then you, we came to, do you remember anything about the house? Yeah, I remember the house I lived in. Uh, what What was it like? It was it was a, a nice house back in that day. Uh, had a big chimney, it's white, and had a porch, and uh, it got blew down the hill a ways. It's on a high hill. You can see it from the highway going to Tish over there. Oh yeah. You can see where it used to stand, the hill. It got blown it, down. Yeah, the we hill? went to the cellar one night. Came up a cloud, and. Uh, we heard the bricks hitting the cellar door. Daddy hollered, our house is gone. He peeked out. And, our house is gone. It, it blew down the hill. It didn't hurt it much, but it tore the chimney down, of course, and they had to re, you know, pull it back up the hill and re-put the fix the huh. chimney. <laughs> but uh, I was about five years old, uh, and we moved from there over where Maxine Converse lives, right there where her house is, or Maxine used to be Converse. It's uh, Maxine Dunn, Maxine. Neely now. I think. Okay. <laughs> um, what? Uh, tell me about your. Tell me about your mom and dad. Well, my mother was a little little lady, uh, dark headed. At she had a little Indian blood in her. She looked. She had long black hair, did it up on her head like old time people does, you know. And. Uh, uh, she was only 38 when she died, and she left 10 children, and me and my older sister and my daddy helped raise them. How and, old were you when she passed away? Huh? How old were you when she passed I was, away? Uh, I was born in 1913, and this was 29. I was about 15, I think, or 16. 15 or 16, and my sister was a couple of years old. I'm going to stop there real quick. Talked about, tell us a little bit about your dad. What was your dad like? Oh, he was a... I don't know how to describe him. Uh, of course, they always told me I looked just like my dad. And so you know about what he looked like. But he, he's one of the best daddies in the world, good Christian man, and he always took us to church. And we, uh, when I was about, oh, about 15, I guess, we went to Bold Springs Church. And he was the superintendent of the Sunday school, and, and my uncle gave us an old organ, and I played the organ, and he led the singing. And, uh, that's when I joined the Methodist Church. It was a Methodist Church then. And in later years, I wasn't happy, so I joined the Baptist. Well, that was probably a pretty good choice. <laughs> they, my folks are all still Methodist. Are they? Yeah, most of them. There's a lot of... we. Okay. We want... I want to know... Um, Krista, can you reach up there and shut those blinds? That'll block some of that really yeah. hot light coming through there. Um, I want to know, 
tell me about some of the things in your life, just crazy weird things that, that have happened to you in your life. What, what are some of your favorite things that have happened or the strange things that have happened, kind of like your house getting blown down the hill, that sort of thing? Well, we lived in that same house when I, uh, I remember that. Uh, my mother said I couldn't have remembered it because I wasn't but three years old, but I do remember it. Uh, went to, she was out of snuff. She dipped snuff. She wasn't nasty old dipper, but she was a, she dipped snuff a little bit. And uh, she went down to the neighbors to, to borrow some snuff. She was out of snuff. She had made me a little pinafore dress. I thought it was so pretty. And we was walking back. I remember I was walking behind her. And uh, I kept begging her to let me carry the snuff. It's in a little tin box in my little pocket on my new apron. And she said, no, you might get it in your eyes. I said, no, I won't. She just kept on saying, no, you don't you to get it in your eyes. I remember falling behind her. Her and one or two sisters and brothers was walking with us. And finally, she let me carry it. She said, now be careful now, don't lose it. So I put it in my pocket, and I got a little ways down the road on her way home, and I thought, I don't want to get it in my eyes, so I just took it out and took the lid off and dumped it out on the ground, put it back in my pocket. <laughs> got home, she said, Thelma, where's my snuff? And I handed her the little empty box. <laughs> and she was telling one of the neighbors about it. And I said, I remember that, Mama. She said, you couldn't remember that. You wasn't but three years old. I said, I do remember it. I remember exactly. I can take you right to the road now. <laughs> um. I was going to ask. Uh, the blacks went to different schools, you know, from, from us. And uh, years ago, uh, that was one of the things that, uh, funny things that happened at the end of school, there'd be somebody in the school that would be a black preacher. Uh -huh. My brother was one, and he had a sermon. I wish I'd have got him to write it down before he passed on. But I remember a lot of the... the words in the sermon and he was a nigger preacher oh yeah <laughs> and he, he he they said he had been asked they wanted to know what kind of baptist he was he said he's his hard shell he said he'd rather have a hard shell no shell at all and uh he'd he'd say uh or pers uh, instead of he said persuasion that's pers what pers persuasion he was, was oh, hard persuasion. Baptist. And he'd say uh, a scripture he'd always quote. Say he played, talk, I guess that, I don't know who that in the Bible that was, played the harp. Uh, with a David. thousand strings. Uh, uh, oh, I can't remember that he quote. It was so funny. He was, oh, he made the best old guy you ever saw. It was so funny. That was your brother? That was my brother. And every time we'd go to, to a get together at the school, why they'd all call on him to, you know, preach that sermon, and he he would he'd do it for them just for the heck of it. How many of your brothers and sisters are still with us? I've just got four. Uh, this is four of us girls left out of ten. Well, now how many ratio from boys to girls, brothers and sisters? How many brothers did you have? I had three. Three, Brothers and the rest and were girls. There were seven girls. Wow. Um, do you remember how long it took you, and what was the mode of transportation to go to Durant when you were a kid? Oh, you know, I was I was a, a pretty good-sized girl before I ever went to Durant. Uh, and they talked about the 12-mile prairie, and I thought that was some big thing, you know. I've heard my dad talk about it. And uh, it's after my mother died, and I, my little sister I was raising was, uh, well, it's just not long before I married. And uh, my uncle thought it was, uh, you know, I didn't think nothing about it. Uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't crazy about the boys. I didn't care whether I had a boyfriend or not. But he, he said I need to get out and go, get out and have me a friend like, the, you know, the girls, other girls. and and not just have to stay at home. And of course, me and my older sister, you know, took care of the family and the cooking and housework and everything. And so he, 
One day he, my cousin's up here in the rest home now. She told me, said, said, Dad said, we're gonna take you to Durant. And I thought, you know, I thought that would be some great something because I'd never been to Durant. And they took me to Durant. He bought me material and and uh, his wife made me a dress. How'd you get there? Uh, in his car. We went in his car. And I thought that was the longest road down that 20 mile prairie, you know, to, to, to Durant. Um. When was the first time you, or what was the first movie you ever remember seeing, or, or one of the first? I know you might not. Well, uh, I can't remember. There used to be a movie here at Millburg, silent movie, right down, right where the the Hungry Erie is, except it was north, one about two doors north. And uh, I don't remember. My grandpa ran the store there, and he'd always give me a sack of candy when I'd go in there, and give me a ticket to go down there down and see the movie and I'd go across the street down there and watch the movie. But the first movie I can remember, really the name of it, was that O King Kong. Okay. Now I was I was a teenager then. We was in, out in Shamrock, Texas picking cotton. And I remember it's raining. An old man here in Milburn had an old Model T Ford. And uh, my brother come and got us because he made a crop out there with this guy and he came and got us girls three of us to pick cotton and my aunt and her husband came later uh, from Melbourne out there and lived in a little cotton house where they had four the cotton pickers and I remember us going in that old Model T car he took us to the show at Shamrock Texas and I remember we was going down the street and I kept hearing this woman screaming and uh, it was raining I'll never forget I kept thinking I said, somebody's hurt, somebody's hurt, you know, something's going on. It had me scared. I'd never been to a, a, a movie, you know, that, that was all silent. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went in the movie house, and that's where it was coming from. It was old King Kong, that one of the movies of King Kong, you know, and that where he got that girl on top of that big yeah. old, top of that building. Yeah, yeah building. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was something. What about Hi. what about uh, TV? Oh, where were you when they? Well, we lived right down here in a little old house, and Kenneth went long before he died. Uh, the people here in Melbourne went together and and uh, give money, and they bought a TV for him for Kenneth. That's the first TV we ever owned. Wow, black and white. How old was Kenneth? Uh, well, he was about. He was about uh, 15 or 16. He was 11 when he first we first found out he had muscular dystrophy. But uh, he died. He was uh, almost 19 when he died. And uh, but uh, he he was uh, about 15 then. Tell us about him a little bit. Oh, he, you know, naturally I thought he was smart. But he got to where he had to go in the wheelchair, and he quit going to school. And the teacher came down to our house, and uh, and taught him. And that happened while we lived in uh, New Mexico too. Uh, the teacher came and taught him. But he was. They all said he was. You know, they just was dumbfounded. He was so smart, intelligent. And what'd you do? Did you bump your head? <laughs> Don't you bump your head on the wall? <laughs> I heard a racket. <laughs> uh, but uh, he he uh, they put him in the hospital over from the city, and he told me uh, when they took him up there, he said, "Mama said I'm gonna let him uh, experiment on on my body, and maybe they'll find out something, you know, about that disease and." There won't be, you know, other little kids have to live like I, you know. He was happy. He was happy-go-lucky uh, kid, and he was full of mus mischief, too. They better not do something to him. He'd, he'd, get, he'd chase them in that wheelchair, <laughs> and he'd pick up something, and he'd throw it at them. <laughs> but um, uh, he was, he was, he was, it's always coming up with some kind of something funny. He mm -hmm. was good-natured 
real good natured. Did he uh, did he pass away in the hospital? Huh? Did he pass away in the hospital? Uh. Tell us about that. No, no. Uh, we lived right here in this old house, uh, and uh, he was at home, and he did, and of course, the doctor was coming out ever so often, you know, and it wasn't it wasn't a cure for it. They told us at the beginning it wasn't, and but then he, you know, he had to go into the hospital at times. He'd have pneumonia. That was a, the main thing, and he'd have to go in the hospital when he'd have pneumonia. But that the day that he passed away, he was just an ordinary day. Uh, but Wendell was in high school, and he got up every morning and dressed him and got him in his chair before he went to school. And this morning, that morning, he woke up. He said had a little, he had a little pain in his side, but he felt okay outside of that. So every time Wendell would start putting him in the chair, he'd say, "I can't sit up." You know, he had curvature of the spine, and mm. he was kind of bent over, and that shut off his breathing, I guess, when he sat in the chair, and he had to lay back down. And so he said, I'll get, Mama can get me up later. He said, you're going to school. So I tried to get him up several times during that day, and every time I'd get him up in a sitting position, he'd go saying, lay me down. I can't can't breathe. That pain was in his side, and he cut his breathing off. So, uh, but he was cutting up with Uncle Uncle Law was there, and uh, visiting, and uh, he was joking with Uncle Law uh, that night, and for he left to go home, and uh, Uncle Law was joking with him. He was laughing, cutting up with him, and uh, he needed to use the bathroom, and so Wendell went in there and was trying to help him get him up on when he would have bathroom. He was getting him up on the pot. And uh, every time he'd get him up on that pot, he'd start saying, I can't set up. I can't. And he'd lay him back down. Hi there, boy. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, that he, Daddy said, well, I'll go over and get the, I'll go over and get the, uh, uh, get, uh, oh, why they call it, oxygen tank up from Mr. He, he said he could get it any time, you know, and bring it over so he could breathe better. And him and Uncle Oll even went with him over there, and he died before they got back. He just fell over and just passed away. Just, just went to sleep. Um, tell us about, I mean, you had, you had, tell us about when you met Grandpa. Well... I knew him when we were when we were just kids. About the time I started to school, and uh, in fact, the business I was visiting school with my brothers and sisters that older than me, and they were going to school. They lived uh, back over here on the hill where Mrs. Vessel lives, and uh, I remember them when we'd get off the bus. We lived where our, down where Maxine lives now, in that old house, and. Uh, uh, they'd throw rocks at us. We got out of out the, the wagon. It was a school wagon. We'd get out and we'd start down that road down toward Burt lives, and they lived up on the hill there where Miss Vessel lived. And they'd throw they'd throw chunks and rocks at us. <laughs> Grandpa would. Yeah, him and Doc. They were twins, you know, yeah. and they were uh, what one didn't think of, the other did. <laughs> and but then that was when we were just kids. We were just five and six years old. And then they moved away, and I forgot all about them. Well, I didn't forget them, but, you know, we just knew them as those two mean little beavers kids, <laughs> him and Doc. And when they moved back here then, why, uh, they moved down that Fillmore, and uh, he started coming to church up to Bowles. He'd come up to Bowles Springs, you know, to, but he knew, he knew, you know, quite a few of the, uh, the kids around, and so they they started coming to church up there. And uh, in fact, the business he'd been saying, telling my uncle he wanted to go with me, but he was bashful and he wouldn't ask me, you know. And uh, uh, so one night, one night they told me he said, uh, <laughs> talking. She's gonna be the lady of the house now. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, we went to a party at Fillmore, and 
Uncle Omer and Aunt Jewel. I was staying with them at the time, and and they both said now, was telling me she is fixing me up, getting me ready to go now. I said Dick's gonna ask you out. I said you you know you be sure to you know look pretty and all this that and the other. We went down to that party and come home. She said did Dick ask you? I said no, he didn't. I said I, he don't think enough of me to ask me. I'm not going out. But she said you're right. Well. Bill Ray, my cousin, was working on the other end of it. She ain't gonna hurt as long as she, she <laughs> she's pulling in plastic bags out of there. <laughs> anyway, um, he we had just coming out of the church house over there at Bowl Springs, and and uh, there was another boy wanting to go with me. And, and hold on, okay. So you were going into the church. Oh, we the church is over, and we just fixing to come home, and this boy he'd been. Well, I'd gone with him, but I, you know, I was just—he was just a good friend, and uh, so Dick was there that night, and and uh, he'd been uh, telling everybody he was going, you know, he liked me and he wanted to date me, and so that night I just—I was trying to get away from this other boy, and I just pushed myself over as he went down the steps out of the church, and uh, I whispered to him, I said, "I'm running from somebody." You pretend that you that I'm dating you, that I'm going with you. And so he did. He and that's what he said. Well, said I don't have to pretend. Said I've been wanting to go with you a long time, but I just didn't. I was too bashful to ask you. So well, that we worked together, out nicely, didn't it? We went together off and on for about two years, and huh. we broke up once in uh, in that year out there in the cotton patch in Shamrock, Texas. Why we got back together? In the that cotton night, patch in the night we went to that movie. Huh. It was King Kong? Mm -hmm. Is that the one? Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, there's a bunch of boys from Melbourne went out there with this old guy and this Model T. Uh, picked cotton. And they happened to take... We lived in a little house that they had for the cotton pickers. But they lived in this guy's garage that lived there close to us. And... Uh, he told Dick made the bread. He told him his hands. He didn't. He's afraid he didn't wash his hands good, and uh, so my aunt showed him how to make bread without, you know, not making it like we used to age a long mm -hmm. time ago. Stir it with a spoon and pour yeah. it out on the dough board, you know, and flatten it. Out. So, <laughs> so he, he that's the way he made bread then. And Lonnie come to see Dick before he died one day, and he said, uh, Dick said, you know, we had good times back way back there in them old days we was picking cotton didn't we and, and Dick said yeah but them said Lonnie them old, good old days are gone <laughs> Lonnie said oh we can still laugh about them and talk about them um tell us something about tell me a story about Harley who Harley Harley Earl yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's too many things even I told him a lot of stuff when he was here the other day, and he didn't he didn't remember it. This tree right out here that's got the pecans on it, we just moved here, and uh, that old man out there had grafted a paper shell on it. Well, it was just a little bush like, you know, and he had he had some kind of somebody give him some kind of a, a knife or something that something anyway, and he peeled the bark off that tree out there, and that old man Willingham. He just had a fit because he had grafted pecans on it, you know. And uh, I said, well, he didn't know. He didn't know. There wasn't no fence there then. I said, he didn't know it was your tree, you know. And he just, oh, he had a big, I mean, he got mad. <laughs> and I tried to soften it over. I said, well, I'm sorry, but it was just something. He didn't know. He just a kid from the city that fell on her. It scared her more than it did anything, I think. It didn't, really. It just scared her. Bless her heart. I never thought about them things. Well. It's okay. Here, look. Look here. Look that. It scared her. I, need to, I should have put them in the bedroom in there. You on a pillow? Well, she's, she's 
you in that. That's your heart. Okay. All right. All that dra high drama. <laughs> okay. Tell uh, where were you? You you finished your? Did you finish your story about? Oh, that about the boy that that cut the bark off that tree out there. Oh yeah. Still, still some good pecans on. <laughs> that was Uncle Harley. Yeah. And uh, tell us something about Uncle Bill. Story about him. Oh, Bill. Bill was a. Uh, <laughs> he scared us pretty bad several times. He went over to Royal Fevers just one day. We wasn't far from Wiley, where we lived from him. But he went over there one day, and he was supposed to come back a certain time. He didn't come. And uh, so Dick went down to his sister's and got on. We didn't have a phone called over there. And she said, oh, he left a long time ago. That he should have been home a long time ago. Scared Dick to death because he thought he'd cut through the woods, come by a tank. He was a little duck. I mean, he wanted to, every time he'd seen the water, he got in it when he was growing up. And Dick was scared to death. He was afraid to even go up that tank look. He just knew he'd walk, waited off out in that tank and drown. But he didn't. He finally come home. He was okay. And then another time we lived in New Mexico, and uh, there was a, they had a, they had uh, back over on the hills north of us. We lived down the valley, but there's sand hills. And they brought the trash from town out and dumped it. It was a dump. And the kids would like to go up there, you know, and dig, and they'd find things, you know. And uh, I've still got the fork, I think, that Kenneth found. Dick, uh, Wendell would carry him on his back because, you know, he couldn't walk that far. Well, he went up there one day by himself, and he was thinking about the Indians, how they used to live, and they had the little, what do they call that little thing on them, you know? Oh. Uh, it's like a little skirt-looking yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, he pulled off his clothes, and I don't remember what kind of a jacket or big handkerchief or something he had, he tied around him, and was pretending he'd wandered on off away from there. But that's where Dick went to look for him, because he knew that he, that's where he'd gone. And he found his clothes. And no bill. He come back down to the house, and it was about, I guess it's a quarter of a mile from our house or something like that. He said, Thelma said, that bill has gone crazy or something. He said, I found his clothes and no bill. And uh, he was scared to death, and he left and went back to hunt for him, and, and a big norther blew up. Out there now, they could blow up real quick. It was warm, but man, it was cold, and the sun was just going down. And uh, I seen Billy coming down the hill. Say, Dick had bought his clothes home, and he didn't have nothing to put on. And he'd come up that norther, and I can just see him still, how you call it, like, silhouetted, how you call it, between the sun going down, him coming down that mountain uh, without any clothes. <laughs> he don't like first to laugh and joking about that now. So I've heard enough about that. <laughs> but that was the funniest, he was the funniest sight you ever saw, but I sure was glad to see him. <laughs> and then finally Dick followed him in, but that was so funny. He was about to freeze to death. <laughs> Tell us about uh, something about Uncle Wendell. Well, Wendell, uh, he, 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 he was a, he liked a, he always said he was going to live in the woods. He, uh, when we lived over there, uh, close to where he lives now, up on the hill where his Uncle Roy lived. They thought his Uncle Roy was it. And there was timber all down there on that road going north up where East Smith lives. And uh, he'd wander, he'd go over there a lot, and he'd wander down in them woods and, and just pretend, you know, like he did out there in Arizona or New Mexico, that he was living out in the woods. And several times he'd, he'd get, a, get a little his look, little bag of clothes and, I remember one day he got it, tied it on the end of a fishing pole and put it on his shoulder and said he was leaving home. <laughs> I, I said, well, I hope you have good luck, son. <laughs> but he, he went down to Roy's in the, down there in the woods and uh, he didn't stay all night, but he stayed till pretty late. But one day he got on the, his horse and was riding it down across, down through the woods and the horse jumped a little ditch and he fell off and the horse stepped on his head. He still got the scar on his head. Anyway, I didn't know anything about it. We just lived a short distance from where Roy and Manon lived then. 
and uh, but Dick come home from work that evening, and no. and uh, I said, did you stop by Roy's and pick up Wendell? He said, no. I said, Wendell's in the hospital. I said, what happened? And said, oh, he got on that horse, of Roy's, and, and was across the ditch. He met them taking him to the doctor as he was coming in from work. And uh, so he took him over at Medill to the hospital. But he had that big gash in his head, you know. Hmm. And uh, he, he was, uh, him and Bill both was, Wonders. They love to get out in the woods. They, that, that was their joy. Tell us about Uncle Pat. Oh, Pat. The old man used to live down here calling him Pat the Rat. I don't know any special thing about Pat. I can't think of. Bill was the one that's always slipping off. Something. There's a story about him beat, beating on my, my cousin. Uh, Charles Branch or something. Oh yeah, oh Tell yeah. About that. When it's going to school up here. Charles was a cut up and of course Janet was as mischievous as she could be, you know. And uh, they they'd kinda get into a scuffle sometime at school. And one day she said something to Dick about something and she's uh, about Charles made her mad or something and he, so he told Pat said, Pat said, the next time Charles jumps on to Janet, said, you give him a whipping. <laughs> so the, ne the next time at school that he was teasing Janet, well, he, he gets on him and gives him a whipping. And the teacher gave him a whipping. He said, well, I'm just doing what my daddy told him. What's the matter, What's son? Is he hungry, reckon? Are you, are you hungry? Huh? You want to go sit in that chair? Okay. Right, so, dad, 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 dad. so he apparently he went into the school. Yeah, he went up to school and jumped on to him when he was teasing Janet. Started teasing her. He jumped on to him and and they had a little fight. I, and so the teacher gave him a whipping. He says, "I was only doing what my daddy told me." So. Uh, Leave that there, Callum. So. Uh, <laughs> That's that's what he told the teacher. Said I just my daddy told me to whip him when he would tease my my sister again. <laughs> he was just looking for an excuse, wasn't he? Yeah. Or he was looking yeah. for a reason. Uh, okay. How about Uncle Mike? Well, one day we lived right down here, and he was just a kid. C.B. Hauser lived in the big two-story house, and uh, we missed him. We couldn't find him nowhere. And uh, we looked and looked all over the whole, this whole block, hollering, calling him, you know, and couldn't find him. And uh, finally, uh, someone went, Beth was at home, uh, CB's wife, and they went in the house and asked her if she'd seen him. She said no. And as they was coming out of the house, Mike comes down from upstairs. He'd gone up there, and, and it was warm, and he... I guess he just wanted to go upstairs and see upstairs, and he laid down under the bed and went to sleep. And when he heard us out there, he said, he saw us out there beating the bushes, you know. And I said, well, why didn't you holler? Why didn't you let us know? He said, well, you'd be scared too. I said, I thought y'all was going to beat me to death. I said, y'all was out there beating them bushes, and I could hear you out there <laughs> calling me. I said, I was scared to death to come down. <laughs> but he said, he'd been, said he got up there, upstairs, and... And uh, it was warm up there, and he's just sitting there looking out the window. And next thing he knew, he was sound asleep, laid down there on the floor, and went to sleep under the bed. All right, tell us about uh, Annie Lane. Something about Annie Lane. Well, one time uh, was uh, her and uh, her 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 cousin was a Church of Christ, and. Uh, She'd go sometimes up to the church, Church of Christ Church, whether it's because she's her, you know, her friend and all. And this one time that's going to, I don't remember where it was, somewhere to some kind of a youth meeting, and uh, Elaine went with her and uh, went in the car with her, uh, uh, oh, with these people right here, the pages. 
they they was a church of Christ, and she and they went. He was a preacher up here, and she went with the church over there. Elaine went with her, and and when they started to come home, why, instead of coming back with the preacher, she Patricia's boyfriend was there from out on the prairie, and so she got the car with them, and it's coming around Wiley Corner out here, and it's going too fast, and they had a wreck. They rolled over, and. We was scared to death when the, we got the word that she'd been in a car wreck, you know. And Dick had just bought her a new pair of shoes. And when she got home, she didn't have but one of the shoes. And she was worried about that other shoe. Said, Daddy'd be mad, you know, because she'd lost that new shoe. <laughs> but uh, she was scared to death. I mean, she was a shaking. She was scared to death. And, and of course, we was, uh, Daddy didn't whip her or anything, but he got on to her. Said, next time you go to church, somebody you come back with who you go with. She said, don't you worry, Daddy, I will never do that again. She was scared to death. But she was crying because she thought Daddy was going to whip her because she'd lost one of her new shoes. <laughs> Tell us about uh, Aunt Nancy. Oh, Nancy was one that was a pretender. She, um, she, if you, Elaine was always wanting you to do something for her, or, or whining and wanting me to let her iron or something when she's little, you know, and pester me. But Nancy'd get off in the corner somewhere with her little paper dolls, and you'd never hear a word from her. She pretended, you know, a lot. And she pretended she wasn't old enough to go to school. And uh, one day she was, uh, the boys was going to Fillmore School, and Jackie Carter, you've heard of Jackie Carter, I'm sure, uh, was her best friend. Somehow or another, that stuck in her mind, Jackie Carter. And she told me that her and Jackie Carter was going to get married. She was just a little girl, a little, little bitty thing. We hadn't, wasn't even school age. And uh, we lived up there on the hill, just across from where I was telling you about that, uh, going to Fillmore over there, where that woman that married George was going to be up there. That's where we lived. And she packed she got Dick's little lunch bucket and packed her some clothes in it and went and walked down to the road uh, and said, she says, I'm going down there and wait on Jackie. He's coming by and he's going to take, we're going to go get married. Now imagine that a little girl that age. And I said, well, one, during, she come back up to the house, of course. But during that day, I said, I just keep hearing cars going up that road. They're getting stuck because when it rained, that road was you know, they get stuck on that road because it wasn't graded or nothing up north. And I said, I heard one down there, Just it's been just a, you know, buzzing. They're stuck, I know. And she said, well, that's Jackie. He's coming at you. <laughs> She's always telling things like that. Imagination. She had imagination. All right, tell us about, uh, about Janet. Oh, Janet was a tomboy. <laughs> She was a, she was a, I said, she's the only one of my kids uh, that would uh, always say, Mama, bye, when she'd go to school. She'd, you know, walk when we live in the big two-story house. And uh, she'd always holler bye when she'd go to school. And when quick as she'd hit the porch, front porch, she got it, Mama, I'm home, Mama, I'm home. And, and the others, they'd just come in when they come in. And Mom, she'd always do that. And these Caldwell boys down here, she was just big a tomboy. They didn't get no higher in the trees than she did, and and she was she was wasn't afraid of nothing. And at Tommy Caldwell told his mama one day, she told me that he said, "I don't think Nancy's a girl. Uh, Janet's a girl. Said she's not afraid of frogs or lizards or nothing." <laughs> I bet he I bet he didn't get his nap out probably. But anyway, you better act right, son. Stand up and reckon he's hot. What's wrong with you? Mom said, she said to her she's got married. She said, I'm going to go see that, that boy that got her out of that tree. <laughs> what is it, huh? She said what? Said, I'm going to go see that boy that got Janet out of that tree. Said he had to get her out of the tree to marry her. <laughs> What's well, the matter? What's that? Guys, uh, you made movies of it. Of oh, yeah. You and them boys. James Blonde? Uh, yeah, and that, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>
Do you have that? A copy of that? No. I'd love to have it, too. Well, it I'd so be funny. afraid you'd show it to people. <laughs> it was so funny. There goes a male carrot, I believe. She's stopping. Um, I, I probably got some... Somebody wanting money. That's all I ever get, usually, in the mail. Okay, so we talked about your kid and we talked about your husband. And I think we talked about all of them. Um, did we talk about all of them? I think so. Okay, I thought I thought. I think so. Mike was the last one that he had up here in the yeah. neighbor's house. You had the so many of them, it's hard to keep track, huh? And it'd take us three days to do all your oh my grandkids goodness. and great-grandkids. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, what do you think is the most, we're going to get philosophical here for a minute. <laughs> what do you think is the most important thing uh, about life? What have you tried to make the most important thing in your life? Well, when I, when I was a kid, as the Bible says, you know, I thought and acted as a kid. But after I got up, especially after my mother passed away, and I had to shoulder the responsibilities of being a mother to my little sister who was only a month old. Uh, of course, I knew something about it because uh, I'd helped her with the others, you know, that came along uh, before her. Uh, but uh, I don't know why uh, I didn't have a I didn't I didn't have a urge to get out and I'd rather that was my joy, you know, because I just loved babies all my life. No wonder I had so many, um, and and I just you know I just they were like dolls to me. My all my little brothers and sisters that I helped Mama with, and I heard her tell my daddy just before she passed away one night she's having one of those heart heart attacks. They they don't have them now. When they have them, I guess they go to a doctor and they give them something. But back then, now she had they called it leakage of the heart. But she'd wake up in the middle of the night and she'd just be screaming. Her heart had just be hurt so bad, and and uh, and I'd hear her and Daddy talking, you know. And uh, I heard I heard Daddy say, "Lillian," she said. She told him one night. Our bed was by my sister's just across the hall from there. So I heard heard her say uh, one of these nights uh, that you know it's going to be my last one, you know. And he said, "Lillian, you just can't you can't leave me. What in the world would I do with this baby and all these kids?" And you just can't leave me, you, you know. And uh, he go, he had a place where he prayed. Went up to a, an old shed up, at the foot of the hills where we lived there then in Western Oklahoma. And uh, I'd hear him out there, you know, praying every day. He had a certain time to pray. I'd hear him praying. And and Mama took one of her spells one day while he was up there praying. And uh, so when he come to the house, I told him. I said, Mama just had was had another bad spell, and I said I heard you praying for her, and I said she said that she she went to feeling better. I told her you was up there praying, and she she wanted to know where he was, and I said he's up at the barn up there at that old barn praying. I heard him praying, and she said, well, said I'm feeling better, and uh, so I told Daddy that, but uh, he also told her said you just can't leave me and leave. I don't know what I'd do with all these these babies. And she said, Wes, said, I'd trust Thelma with this baby as much as I'd trust myself. And so when she did pass away, why, well, she's just like a doll to me, you know. I, I just, I didn't want to do nothing else, only just be a mama to her, you know. And uh, so she, she'll she always be, you know, like one of my own, because it, it, she just, and we almost lost her. She uh, almost didn't make it. And a, a, an old doctor, he probably, uh, he's got to be dead and gone now, um, lived out at Benson, Oklahoma. I went down to my aunt's. She come up there and told Daddy, said, let me take them and the baby down there and see if I can help. Maybe we could get her straightened out. She cried day and night and uh, with colic. And uh, the milk didn't agree with her. In formula, we tried everything we ever heard of, and and nothing agreed with her. And so, I went down there, and we went over to Vincent, oh, that little town west of Reed, where she lived. And somebody told her about this old baby doctor, and 
And so he told us what to do when we got home. And we done it, and she never cried anymore. I mean, she was uh, only just once in a while <laughs> to pick a boot. <laughs> and she sweetest just saying, and uh, she uh, come out of it, and uh, this old doctor told us, he said, uh, you need to take a picture of her when you get home. So if you do what I tell you, said in two weeks you won't know this baby. And uh, so uh, Daddy had he come come down there from Reed. It wasn't very far from where I mean from Jester where we lived to Reed. And uh, he just he just went to Baldwin. He said, I I can't believe that's my baby. She that's how much she had changed. And I said, the doctor said you would know her. And wanted us to take a picture, but we didn't have a camera. And then take another one, you know, in two weeks. But what, all he done, and I gave that I gave that recipe to a lot of women that had babies after that, and they they just, you know, did good on it. It's really it was buttermilk, hmm. and she loves buttermilk to this day, and I do too. She told Aunt Lily they had cows. He said when you get home, it was uh, late in the evening. Said you go out and pick out one of your cows, and just use this same cow's milk each time and uh, he told how many ounces you know uh, and put it on the stove and bring it don't let it boil but bring it heat it to a boiling point and then take it off the fire and let it set till it cools down just milk warm said there'll be a little skim uh, on it but said that won't hurt a thing uh, said and then I don't remember how many ounces of lactic acid but that's all that we done so many drops and after after she got up bigger you, I didn't even have to count the drops I just poured that lactic acid in there and beat it uh, as uh, I poured it in there and the quick as it turned the buttermilk that's all you needed hmm. and then put some k roll syrup you wouldn't have knew her but she's that little thing now she just she makes me think of my mama live be the old stoop thing and she has back trouble and she's twisted and uh, you know she, she has she has what Janet's got at uh, Go look at the window. Go look outside. Uh-huh, narcolepsy. But uh, that I just like I said I didn't I didn't care about the boys, you know I didn't uh, I, I I was happy you know. He's did he learn how to open that? Yeah. I bet he did because. It's a hat on though. The neighbors wanted. To yeah, look. some of the some of our neighbors wanted to take Janet. Wanted to, I mean, Floridine wanted to, Daddy just let them have her, and raise her. And he said, "No," I said, "We're not going to. We're going to stay together." I said, "As long as one has something to eat, we'll all have." So we'll make it some way. So we moved from out there back to down here close to out there close to where Jackie Callan and lives now and uh, so that's um, where we lived the rest of the time till I got married what do you you know what I mean when I say when I say your legacy uh, what do you want to be your legacy um, how you're children and your grandchildren and great grandchildren and so on remember you what what uh, do you want remember me as uh, uh, wishing and doing the best I could and and uh, and uh, and and just uh, I had I had a good life it was a hard life back in the depression when we had you know I didn't have electricity or nothing. It was a hard old go, but uh, uh, I was happy because everybody seemed to be in the same boat, and we all, you know, we didn't have uh, very much, but we we'd have singings and prayer meetings at our house, and part with well, with little parties that the kids in the community would come over. But what the, my legacy, my only legacy is that uh, just that my family uh, grow up and love God and serve Him and. And uh, the way the world is now, I don't know what, why people don't see that time's short. I think, I think, I think the days are 
getting short because there's too much in this world that's going wrong. Don't you believe that? Absolutely. I, I do. I believe I believe that it, we're getting close to the end of time. Yeah, time I, I just yeah. can't believe it. Uh, and uh, that's what I hear you know, when I first got sick. I guess it was partly uh, that and then Harley and them coming back here and them, you know, uh, just that just threw cold water on our whole family because they just, they're so different. They're, you know, his kids are, they don't think of anything, but I don't know. They're just, they don't even think about the hereafter or anything. And uh, they, that little boy come this morning with Harley over here. He's 12 years old and he still pot, potties his pants. He smelled so bad this morning, I couldn't hardly stand for him to get close to me. And he, I asked Carly, I said, why is he in school? But see, they, he's, been, he's been such a, they had him in places out there when they're still out in, in uh, Las Vegas, and they wouldn't even keep him. Hmm. And he's got a counselor now that's a, uh, and he's he's got some schoolwork, but, He's not going to school, but just, I think, so many hours a day. Hmm. And uh, and I feel sorry for Harley. Harley's never been. Him and Berna, him and Berna it's, it's the kind of home, the environment they, they raised those kids in. And they're, they're just, they're living like they were raised. And, and we're uh, re- reaping but, uh, what was sown. But uh, I... Uh, Hello? think Harley's changing. Hey there. Well, I hear you loud and clear. Well, it, it's working. Okay. Uh, alrighty. The jolliest person. Us kids love to go to her house when we was kids growing up. Cause she she was the funniest thing. She just s- kept you laughing, put the jokes on you, and and she would and she just laughed. And she was really a, a good neighbor. And my sister was dying in the in the hospital. She was a nurse up there, at Tish, uh, with uh, cancer. And my sister from Amarillo come down here, and she was so mad at some of them nurses. The way they you know they just she didn't think this taking good care of of my sister. She said, nobody takes care of my sister but Dora Palmer. <laughs> that was her mother. Are you going to pick up? Yeah, I'll pick up. I'll be right out. Well, I- this is um, maybe a little strange for you to talk about, but um, how old are you now? You're, eight, you're almost 90? Be 90 in June. And... Um, not too many people have the opportunity to I mean once you pass on you're gone and and sometimes there are things left unsaid and maybe Mm -hmm. things that you would like to tell your family as a Uh, whole I've got some things wrote down uh, back in some of my junk that uh, I thought of I wanted to say if we showed this video at your funeral and your family was all out there and my van's going to blow up. Well, Not the van. To the Hit car. The oh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, and if, if this was on a big screen and all of your family, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids were all sitting out there and, and you were gone, um, what would you want to tell them? I just tell them that I'm in a better place and I love them and uh, I did the best I could with them and I hope they all would would learn to that the time's short here on this earth and they need to get ready to meet their maker. And that's my wish, is for all my children to le- to learn to know the Lord, become Christians and serve Him. Okay. 
I love you so I much. You too. Oh, I wish, I wish my. It's for all of my children to le to learn to know the Lord, become Christians and serve Him. Okay. I love you so I much. You too. Oh, I wish I wish my boys were as good as you are. In that way, because they just I don't know. You, you I guess one thing. Well, my daddy was so. Uh, I mean, he was su such a religious man, and but. I, all of my brothers become Christians, but they, uh, but they, they didn't go to church like they should. I mean, my brothers, and then my boys, you know, same way. Now, the, uh, now Wendell says that the Lord saved him when he took the drink away from him. He, 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 he said, I didn't. Said I wasn't ashamed to fall on my knees and cry out. Said it wasn't to God was the one that delivered me, and he. I think he's a Christian, but he, he won't go to church, but he thinks that. He's one of those kind of thinks that he can he can be a Christian and, and serve the Lord just out in the woods or anywhere he yeah, is. Yeah. But I'm um, hoping he's going to get his eyes open. And Harley, I've been praying for him, and he's softening up. And and I think he sees now he made a big mistake. And he well he admits it when he's going. Uh, him and Verna, they drank, and uh, they raised their kids the wrong way. If he if he'd. Uh, uh, now that don't mean it, that, that they can't, they won't. I think in time they will. And they told me that uh, Verna, I, I witnessed to her and him both when they were here, drinking and all. And Bernice down here, my best friend, passed away. She'd had the open heart surgery just like Verna did. And I told Verna, sitting right over there at my that day, I said, Verna, that could have been you. I said, she took good care of herself. I said, she got that open heart surgery the doctors told her no drinking no smoking and she she had she wanted to live she had to take care of her, herself and i said that could have been you because you are not being careful you're not doing what you ought to do and she sat there and told me that the doctor didn't tell her not to smoke or drink or nothing and and her daughter was sitting right over there kathy the oldest girl she said mama don't sit over there and tell that I said you know better than that the doctors told you that you couldn't smoke or drink alcohol or nothing. But she's going to make us think, no. Tastes pretty good, Lydia. Uh, huh? Kathy. Oh, she's a sweet girl. She is sweet. I mean, she's a darling. And she was, when they, she was a girl, they'd come to us. I heard ever started to leave. She didn't leave her grandma. She what she was going in, going back in her day. Of you. He did. He, he, he mean her, him and her both were. And I told those kids, I said, don't blame it all on the Harley. I said, Verna was just like him. I've heard her when we lived down here in the big house tell them that she's going to knock them through the wall, going to knock their heads off, beat their brains out. I've heard her, heard her talk to those little kids like this devils, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't blame Harley for all of it. I said, it takes two. They both, they both uh, weren't, didn't treat you kids good. You, but they don't, they don't have to do it because they was brought up that way. But they are. They're, they're bringing their little kids up the same way. Yeah. Hmm. Earl, Earl uh, over there where he lives right now, out this side of Tish, uh, <clears throat> coming out of Tish, I was in that house while Kathy is here. We went there, and they don't have any furniture. I haven't seen, didn't see the bedrooms. I don't know if they even got a bed to sleep on. They don't have clothes. They're dirty. Every time they come, it looks like they've wore their clothes for a week. They probably don't have money to even go to the laundry. Hmm. And uh, they didn't have anything in that room in there except a little old TV thing and and uh, some of those folding chairs and a, of those metal trunks, not what you call them. They, they sat in their glasses like it was a coffee table. Hmm. And over here in the corner, there was a big wagon, wheels that big around. A green, pretty wagon, and I glanced at it. Oh, I'm that, and it was a beer bottle. Now that's what the boys. Mm -hmm. Not he paid for that.